aware of your own concept of how you're relating to rea reality. Last week, we were talking a lot about the Mandela effect and how each reality that we're in has its own projected past and future. And rather than traveling in one reality through time, we are traveling through realities that all exist in a infinite plane or sea or song, a uni verse, a uni song, it's infinite song, an infinite vibration of time that's all existing now. And so we went over a whole bunch of Mandela effects. And today I would like to discuss what that means. How do we use the Mandela effect to help us transurf through realities? And a lot of it has to do with us being aware of our inner self. That term from a psychological standpoint is called introspection. It's like perception, but it's inside our self. And I'd like to start this first off by, since I'm on the, the Human Garage Instagram channel, you guys are familiar with the fascial maneuvers where we are doing things like being in a position that looks like we're in a womb, right? We're all twisted up and we're all held tight together. And we are also saying things like, I forgive myself, I forgive my mother, I forgive my father. My interpretation of that is that we're actually doing what? We're traveling to a reality of the past. And in this present moment, we are forgiving. What does forgiveness mean? For, all right, I'm going to actually bring this up because it's pretty cool. Forgive actually means from a old English old English it means to give up to pardon to remit it essentially means to let go to let go to forgive and why would we let go? We would let go to gain ourself back. We, we get the energy from the past back into now. We detach. We decide. Decide means to cut off. So when we forgive, I forgive my mother, I forgive my father, I forgive myself. We are detaching from that reality. Now, Once again, my interpretation, my interpretation of that, and this goes into manifestation as well. And also what we talked about last week was a memory board as opposed to a vision board. So instead of always looking forward onto what we are going to get, we must first detach from the illusions, as someone in the comments said, the illusions of the past. I'm asking to increase volume. So actually, I'm going to get the big boy here. Check, check, sound check. How does that sound? Dealing with microphones off screen. Now we got one right in front of my face. It should sound better, though. Let me know if you guys can hear me. Check, check, check. All looks good on my end. Detachment. Letting go is one of my biggest lessons here, and I am constantly working at it. Sound is good. Thank you, Jack Yo. Jack Yo. Jack Yo. Okay. All right. So 
manifestation, if we're always looking to get more, if you guys have a full bucket of life, of reality, of yourself, if you have a full bucket of yourself, which we're always carrying around, we're always carrying around to the brim, we're filled up with what we know of as self. And if we're looking to add into that, where is the space there? Is there any space there? How do we create space there? Is it necessary to create space there? I've found that more importantly to know where we're going, to have alignment with the reality that we're going, it's more important to let go of what you currently are a hold of. Literally to forgive. <laughs> I'm looking, I'm looking at this etymology that I just brought up. And I just looked it up right now. I wasn't planning on it. And it's always a, a wild card when I when I look up words, but give up. We give up ourself. And that reminds me of the childlike wonder, not knowing, but just wondering not being attached to a story and just wondering. And that's a, that's a main leg in yogic tradition as well. Contemplation. So when we forgive, we give up the story of the mother. We give up the story of the father. And then that allows us to rewrite that or we can just be if we are at the level where we are able to just be this is somebody who may be well practiced at things like meditation or mindfulness or forgiveness they're in the flow we're talking about people that can go into gamma brainwave states that may be able to reach high levels of samadhi. Not everybody's here. There's a very, very small percentage of people that can ride this wave, that can be on the razor's edge. For the rest of us, there's techniques that we can use. And I've found a lot of impact by using technology that's similar to how we use noise canceling headphones or even earthquake dampeners. If you guys, who here has noise canceling headphones? I've used them before. I had a set of Bose and they were amazing. You could, I, I would ride my motorcycle with them. I had a, Polaris slingshot vehicle as well for like three or four years. That was my only vehicle. It didn't have a roof. It had three tires. And a lot of times if I was on the freeway, I'd be wearing a motorcycle helmet and it would be very windy because the windshield basically was right here. And then there's just wind blasting straight into my face going 90 miles an hour is very windy. So having noise canceling headphones and for myself, I was listening to audiobooks. It worked pretty well. It was amazingly well if you use those things in a crowded room or an airplane. And how many of us know how those things work? Because they're, they're not just simply earplugs. They don't block out the noise. How noise-canceling headphones work is they're actually registering the vibration of sound that's coming into the noise canceling headphones. So there's actually a receiver and then it matches that same exact sound frequency to essentially cancel it out. It gives the opposite match of sound frequency to mat to cancel it out. That's why if you have noise canceling headphones, sometimes you can flip that on and off. And when you have your, maybe you have over the ear kind, and if you turn on the noise cancellation, all of a sudden you hear this like 
it's almost like this static, like, but everything's silent. And then you turn it off and you, that static goes away. It's like a little, little subtle static sound. It goes away. And then you have just like a little bit dulled noise from the room. But as soon as you flip it back on, all that noise goes away and you hear a little bit of, of static. What that is, it's, it's canceling that noise out. And then it adds into that music or an audio book. And that's super crystal clear because you don't have all that background noise. And earth dampening, I should look that up to give you guys earth dampening, earthquake. Actually, it's earthquake dampening is what I, what I meant to be searching. Earthquake dampening. So there are these puck shaped things that go into, there's no good pictures of it. Practical engineering. So if you go to this website, practical engineering and tuned mass dampeners, skyscrapers, I'm sure there's, the I'm sure there's something in there. Anyways, what an earthquake dampener, that's what they're called, does is an earthquake's happening and inside the building is this gigantic machine that's sensing the movement and it's applying the exact opposite movement, frequency, vibration into the earthquake, into the ground. And then it's keeping the building solid more solid i should say it's keeping it's it's there's still that little static but it's definitely quiet compared to the grounds contrast to the still building now i like to use that same technology within ourselves because we are a piece of technology and how we can relate to the earthquakes the distracting noise of our past and even our future and even our present it all happens in the present but if in the present moment we're attached to the past it's very difficult for a lot of us to remember that full bucket i was talking about to remove a piece of us it's very difficult if i told you hey don't think of an elephant it's very difficult for us to not think of the trauma, to not think of that time that this person let me down, that time this person hurt me, this time I embarrassed myself, this time I hurt somebody else. It's, it's not so easy. Again, if you're well-practiced at doing this, we can... We have these abilities to just dip, 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 tinker, push buttons, flip switches of our memories, of our current emotional states, of our mindsets. Athletes are very good at this. Actors are even better at this. This is what a lot of the initiate schools, mystery schools, the practices they run people through have a lot to do with them controlling, manipulating, being able to activate certain emotions, mindsets to eventually be able to have a greater grasp on reality itself because we are the tuning fork that all of this is vortexing around. Again, I'll just give some proof if anybody out there has noticed on times where they may be under the influence of certain compounds, you may notice that reality gets a little bit weird. Even though all you're doing is walking through the mall or wherever you're at down the street, the same street you always do, if you're under the influence of cannabis, LSD, something like this, you may realize that like, wow, how come all the weird stuff happens when I'm weird? 
when I'm a little, when I've ingested something that to get me a little jostled, how come it seems like everything around me is doing that at the same exact moment? Is it because I'm noticing it that way? Or is it because it's actually forming around me in the same frequency that I'm in? Okay, so how do we how do we use this sound, this sound noise cancellation, this earthquake dampeners? How can we use that in our past? So I have a few exercises. What one do we start with? There's one where we go back to our mother the moment she knows that she's pregnant with us. And we actually place ourselves in that reality and we choose how that is experienced by her. Because that first concept of your being is essentially like the big bang of your reality. That is when a consciousness observed you for the first time. And it's like that saying, if a tree falls in the forest, does it make a noise if nobody's there? My argument to that is it doesn't make a noise unless there's an ear to hear it. Ears are what make noise. We translate that shift in energy into the concept that we know of as noise, as sound. And so your mother's first conception of yourself is her creating you. And how she viewed you, how she viewed your pregnancy, I guess we're going on with this practice. <laughs> I was just, I was going to start with the other one. How she viewed you is likely how you view everything that you're creating. So think about it. Your your mother, like literally think about it, imagine it, go into the image nation. Image refers to hue, light, nation re refers to place. So in your imagination, it's a, it's a place of light. It's not, it's non-physical, but it's still a place. And right now that place that reality of your mother's first concept of you you're pregnant it's a boy it's a girl they actually don't know that until many weeks later but you're pregnant positive or negative right is usually or or two lines on the stick versus one line so all of that happens to your mom and take yourself to that place and meditate close your eyes right now obviously not operating heavy machinery or holding fragile items. If you close your eyes right now and, and go back to that moment, when your mom is finding out about you for the first time, And observe. And I'd love to have you guys here for five minutes. Well, you can do this more later. We're on a live though, so there is an audience watching, popping in and out. And so you're, you're back in the place where your mother is first finding out that she's pregnant with you. What do you notice? What do you notice about the place? You guys can put this in the comments too. What do you notice about the, the place? What do you notice about 
how she's feeling, how that news was delivered to her. Did anything pop up? And this can be pure imagination. It, it doesn't matter if it's, quote, correct. We learn that with the Mandela effect. Reality, especially the past, is fluid. Our relationship to the past is our relationship to the past. We can go in. We can introspect. And we can find that answer how it is now. Now for me, my mother was young. There was a lot of stuff going on in her life. I believe my father and her just started dating and now she's pregnant with me. And my dad wanted to move across the country and now she's pregnant with me. And so for me, should we imagine, this is a comment, should we imagine it how we'd like it or include the details we've heard? So you're getting one step ahead. So if you imagine it how you like it, great. If you imagine it, if you want to go one step at a time, imagine it as it is. And not everybody is going to be imagining shadows. For me, I did. It was my mom underneath a tree being told the news and having like a weak, scared, timid sensation. No, sh not shame so much, but like, do I tell this boy that I'm dating the news because he has dreams of moving away from this state and this is going to stop him from doing that. So it was this confusing, I want to do the right thing for the benefit of somebody else, but I will sacrifice my own comfort for the sake of him or her. Now, here's the thing, everybody. When I imagine that, and I, and I look back at how I live my life, that is literally how I lead into every situation. I'm always looking to care for the other person's feelings over my own. It's never like, this is how I feel. Everybody orient around me. It's, it's almost like I'm blanked out and I'm assessing the room first. When I look back at my past and do I, when important things are happening, how am I saying things? So if this is how we are, when we think into our past, so I analyze all these things, right? I've done past life regressions. It's, it's similar. And I always am skeptical. Like, is this just me in, implanting my own default mode onto this imagined memory and I'm just manipulating how I think that it would go based on my perception. And what I've come to after over 20 years of being in the psychological field, I went to school for this, is that it doesn't matter. The, the whole point, everything about this exercise has to do with you. And so, yes, of course, you are putting your spice into this imagined memory based on how you know how to think. It's likely that your mom may not think like you. But again, it doesn't matter. There's no need to find out the truth because the truth operates in a single reality framework. It operates in we're traveling in one reality that never changes. And so there's only one way that things have ever happened.
We spent an entire hour last week, last Wednesday. If you guys want to go back seven days ago, we spent an entire hour giving examples of how the past does change. And so now we're going to be working within that framework. So things like, well, is it true or not? Doesn't matter. It, it just doesn't because what matters is how we're relating to it in the present moment because the past doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. And the attachments that we have to the past realities that we traveled through to get here doesn't necessarily mean that that's the same past that this reality is oriented around. And if we are holding on to a certain event, especially the ones that hurt us, so we got a rocket ship. It's coming to this platform that we call now, and it's coming from this, this part. Now we're now. And if we're attached, this rocket ship can only go in one place, the same trajectory that it's always went. But if we have a more dynamic, open, detached view of how we relate to the past and we're able to accept a more fluid-like reality, then we can come from a different past. We can rewrite that past and that rocket ship can go in any direction that we choose based on our present orientation. And once again, the truth of is this is true or not, I've went through this a thousand times. Whether what I'm saying or not is true or not doesn't matter because whatever concept we actually have, let's say that we are in the concept of there is one reality that is solid, fixed to be like it's, it's, it is, it was always this way. There was no change and shifts in the past. There's cause and effect. What we do today is going to affect tomorrow and that's going to affect the next day and only happens one way. If that's our concept, it still works. The way that we relate to the past, that's solid. The person that's going to move forward into the effect of the cause of today is going to be way more capable if they have a more empowered relationship with the past rather than a broken relationship with the past. And we're the only ones responsible to do this. Now, somebody that goes through these practices, we can still go through them like they're fake, like they're imagined. It doesn't matter. It doesn't even matter if you feel like this is real or not. It doesn't matter. It still is going to have impact. And for me, that's, that's the... I need to switch into my business brain right now because I use this concept. I can't believe I don't know this word. That's the... Ah... Uh, I can't remember it. That's, that's what we're measuring. That's what I measure. That's, that's the critical thing to measure is, is it having impact in your life or not? Measuring whether something is true or not is very little, it has very little meaning. It, it, it doesn't matter if something's true or not. If you do it and it has impact in your life, why would it matter if it's true or not? Okay. So how does that work? So we talked about bringing up that concept of mother, and then we simply, like a Hollywood director, rewrite that scene in the greatest way possible. And then so we get into a theta state. We might do some movement, we might do some fascia maneuvers, we might do a creo, we might do some breath work, we might do it after exercise, after sex, before sleep, just getting up from sleep, when the brain is calm, 
before you look at your phone, not any time near the time you looked at your phone, not any time near the time that you made a hard decision, not after getting off the, the road on a car, but a time when you're able to relax and you are relaxed and there's no impeding, distracting thoughts coming. This is very important when it comes to reprogramming. Your brain is a, your brain is a piece of technology that is facilitating your adaptation. It's, it's like a translator of your soul that knows everything coming into this physical body. It's translating the experience for you. And your brain has programs. And these programs are written and reprogrammed in a theta state. This is the same frequency that your brain is in naturally from ages like three to seven. And so there's a lot of, what I learned in psychology school was that children learn a lot better, faster, deeper than adults do. That's just like what they tell you. Okay, why? And what I've come to realize is that it's the brainwave frequencies. They're in, they're, they're, their programming is open and it's able to be hard wired into the piece of technology that we call the body. We call the brain, we call the, and, and, and that's, that's translating the greatness of ourself into our concept of ourself, our mind. And so theta isn't open forever. It's, it's naturally occurring two to seven, eight years old. And then the brain says, okay, I have a good fix on what reality is like. I, I understand the rules here, where I'm at, what the environment's like. Do I need to be fearful? Does that help me? Do I, do I need to be assertive? Do I fear dark rooms? Do I fear being alone? Do I run to strangers? All of that stuff is happening in Theta, and then it's going to just continuously repeat for the next 70, 80, 90, 100 years of life, and that's really good. That, that has worked really good. And for us just to see a scary movie at 14 years old, well, that's interesting. I was going to make an opposite point, but when we do things like watch scary movies, what are we doing? We're in theta. Again, we're becoming one with the couch. We're literally just sitting on the most comfortable thing in a meditative trance-like state. And so the things coming into the TV are programming us the same way we were programmed when we're two years old to seven years old. But before I go on to that, because that's a completely separate tangent point, the reason why we're not in theta our entire life is because it wouldn't be efficient. It wouldn't be efficient for us to just see a new piece of information every single day and completely rewire and, and reorient ourselves to reality. It just wouldn't be efficient. So a lot of that gets processed when we're laying down to bed. You can actually feel it processing in theta and it's happening underneath our awareness our our capacity of our mind which isn't only in our head but the capacity of our psyche i should say which encompasses our emotions encompasses more than just mind the capacity of our psyche is tens of thousands 
of times greater than the capacity of what is otherwise known. And some people have different names for this. They call it subconscious, unconscious. But our subconscious, let's call it underneath consciousness, is way more powerful than what we can quote consciously, because I know it's all consciousness, but what we can consciously perceive. What we can consciously perceive and work with in a mental capacity is about equivalent to 120 to 180 bits of information. And that's computer talk, but a bit of information is like a packet of information. And 120 bits of information can be translated into two conversations. So having a conversation with one person is 60 bits of processing power we would need. Having a conversation with two people is 120 bits. So you're talking to your mom on the phone and your significant other is also talking to you. We're getting to about the max of our capacity. You add a third person onto that, so now your roommate in the other room is also trying to talk to you about rearranging their desk in that room. You're talking to your mom and you're talking to your significant other. We start to lose the ability to process in between the second and the third conversation. And that's not counting the color of the ceiling. We're not even aware of that when we're doing this because we're at the max of our capacity to consciously hold on to, to grasp focus. 120 bits. Okay. We're not concerned with the color of our roommate's shirt. Like we don't even see it. Uh, you guys know this famous experiment. A gorilla can, maybe you don't know this, but in psychology, it's a, it's a famous experiment where you guys should actually Google it. Um, how can you Google it? Just Google uh, uh, basketball. I think I'm going to have to tell you. Selective attention test. Actually, I don't need to tell you, but I feel like I'm going to need to tell you in order to make the point. Selective attention test. Actually, better. Yeah, I think I can actually. I just want to get rid of this. How do I mute this? Okay, so we're going to actually just pull this up on the screen here and we're going to go over it and you guys can see. So what we're doing is, I wonder if they're going to tell us the instructions, but what we're doing is counting the amount of times that the ball is being passed back and forth, I believe. Let me see. Count how many times the player is wearing white past the basketball. How many passes do you count? The correct answer is 15 passes. But did you see the gorilla? Yes, see the gorilla? It walked right through. So we've got a very weak sense. So that's essentially showing that we have what they're terming selective attention. But look at that, a gorilla. And so there's a lot of people don't see the gorilla. And 
when you some people see the gorilla some people are saying like wait did i see a gorilla <laughs> yes i saw the gorilla i saw two balls yeah there are two balls but you're supposed to be paying attention to the white shirts passing so that's just a silly example from 1999 of a test that they did and they were seeing how many people saw the gorilla or not. And there was a significant amount of people that were completely blind to the gorilla. And this is all for me to talk about how weak our consciousness is. It can only really handle two conversations. And this is like one task of looking at the ball having a conversation, 120 bits. Our unconscious subconscious is doing between 2 million and 10 million bits of processing, depending on which study you're looking at. So what we're actually consciously aware of is 120-ish bits, 120 to 180. What's actually happening, what you're, you're brain is actually functioning is two to 10 million bits. Hey Siri, what is 10 million divided by 120? Eighty three thousand times more power necessary to run our unconscious. Now, what's our unconscious doing? Well, it's focusing your eyeballs. It's giving you peripheria. It's allowing your blood to go through your arteries. It's facilitating what's going on in your organs. It's keeping the balance of your fascia while you're standing and walking. It's when you walk into a room and you flip on the light, it automatically knows where that light switch is so you don't have to think about it. It's allowing you to drive while you're looking at the, the radio or text messaging and your foot is just automatically readjusting the gas. All of that stuff is happening underneath our consciousness and all of that stuff is programmed in theta. All of that, you get access to all of that. Theta is the portal into that. That's why things like meditation and things like this exercise of the mother get into theta. We go there. We can reorient how we relate to the past, which is then going to give us a grander sense of self in the present moment. There's another interesting study, which I could probably Google and find, but I'm not going to waste your time doing that, that talks about the, pe the difference between pessimists and optimists and how pessimists are very fixated, focused on the negative aspects of an event and how optimists see the negative aspects and the positive aspects. It's like the pessimists are blinded to the light, the, the good things, and optimists see both the good and the bad. It's, it's not what you would think where the optimist doesn't see the bad. It's just they have a more balanced approach. And now we're all, we're all both pessimists and optimists no matter what. And so if we're thinking back in time in a moment where something happened to us and we're pessimistic about it, we're highlighting the darkness of it. That's all we're going to see. And if we never, ever asked ourselves, why was that good for me? I was just at a conference and uh, Peely was her name. I forget her last name. She was speaking about having a client because she's a mindset coach, having a client who froze when reporters he, he did something, he was a scientist, I think he did something grand and report, he opened the door and reporters were there and he froze and he basically like had, they thought he had a stroke on stage it was, and he didn't have a stroke. They took him to the hospital, he was completely fine. So it was, it was not mechanical in the body, it was psychological. 
she had to figure out like, why did this person literally just turn into a vegetable on stage? And she asked him, have you ever been in front of people asking you questions before? And he immediately remembered a time when a family member, I don't want to say too many details because I don't want to get it wrong, but a family member got shot and he opened the door of his house. He didn't even know they got shot, but he opened the door of the house and there was a bunch of reporters asking him questions about the event. And he froze in that moment as a child. And then so that got programmed into his subconscious many years later when that same scenario happened, he froze and all of that, all of that programming that kept him safe as a child in that moment worked to his advantage then, but it didn't as an adult. So they had to go back and unprogram that. But the reason why it was so traumatic for him is because he was the reason he scheduled an appointment with a stranger to his family member and that person wanted to kill them and shot them. And there's all this guilt about him in that moment. And without him releasing that guilt, he's not going to be able to overcome this program. And the question that they had to go through is how is this good? How is this good? And then they went through this scenario and saw that like, if he wouldn't have made that appointment, the shooting would have happened at a different time, which would have been a lot worse of an outcome but there just so happened to be an ambulance out front when it actually did happen and the life was saved. And so we get to, now this is just, this is an actual, that was at someone's actual experience. We can do that on our own. And again, doesn't have to be real. That's the crazy thing about it. We can get programmed by watching fiction movies. Most of everything that we're taught is fiction. The entire history in school that we learn, some of us have come to realize is fiction. I mean, just look at the present day news. If you guys are watching the present day news on television and don't realize that they have a right to it, but they have an agenda and they will filter us what they would like us program for it. Like, you don't think that the news was done that exact same way? Look at something like the Bible. Whose name's on the front of the Bible? The King James Bible. Why would the king need to rewrite and republish this story? And before that, it was the Council of Nicaea that determined what got put in there or not. And things like reincarnation get taken out because it doesn't serve the rule of the king where he can threaten punishment and he can threaten pain. He can threaten taking stuff away and that will evoke fear in people if you only believe you have one life. You're only here one time. You're going to hold on to your precious valuables and do whatever the king says because we're only here once. And we're not looking at scenarios. We're not looking at life as a lesson, as a cycle that we get to go through many times. And we're here with the knowledge, with the emotional base that we've attained through many, 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 many times through this. And we're experiencing this the way that we are. Okay, without going way down a, a, a biased vision. And so we can do this with the mother thing. So we can do this with any trauma in our life. We can go back. And what I like to do is get into a theta state, relax, breath work, meditation, and then write down an event. And we write down that event, every single detail that we can think of, that happened to us. So this is an actual event. We can go in and we can, we can lighten up the load of how we, how we feel this rocket ship has come to this present moment. And we can bring up, we can remember. To remember means we actually become a part. We 
gain our membership back to that reality. So when we remember our consciousness is actually going to that reality and we bring it up, we, we write it down, we remember it, we feel it, we write down our feelings and just the, just the act of doing that brings this program to the front. It's like a file has just been accessed from the database and you, the more that you remember it and, and, and relive it out, sweat, feel the goosebumps, feel the feelings in the back of your throat going up from your heart up to your throat, feel what that feels like bringing up these scenarios. And if you're in theta, if you're in theta, after this, rewrite it. Be a Hollywood producer, change the lighting, change the script, change the words that were said, change the actions in theta. Do that for as long as you can and then secure with trust. Secure with trust that version of reality. Take three breaths, hands on your heart. That's where this comes from. You can seal in that before coming back to reality. Once again, I have a psychological background. What we... The psychological industry, they, they bring people in and they say, take talk, they, they, they talk about the problems. They're talking about the problems while the person just got off, just got out of their car after driving to the office in traffic, throwing some last minute text messages before coming into the office. And then they're sitting still and then they're rocking back and forth, just being like, I don't want to be here. I get to talk about me being broken again. And there's this, there's already this tension that this is not theta. This is you literally running the program. You just, you just do the first part of that exercise. You run that program, you re-solidify it. And then the person tells you how to, you know, gives you some tools to help yourself. And you're like, okay. Okay, but there's no reorientation around the event. And just to tie in something I spent a significant amount of time talking about before, which was the earthquake dampeners and the sound canceling headphones, that's what we're doing. We bring up the event, we bring up the file, we dampen it. And so even if we don't completely take on the new reality, we're dampening, canceling out, detaching from this, giving us one step closer, getting us one step closer to the optimism where we can actually see the light and the dark, the dark, I should have emphasized the other way around, the dark and the light, the gift of the moments that made us who we are today. I'll be here next week, Wednesday, noon Pacific time. If you are in Southern California, go to humangarage.net. We've got some events coming up this Saturday and the Saturday after. No, Sunday. What are the Sundays? Sunday and the Sunday after. We've got a hands-on workshop, which is for practitioners. And uh, I'll be there. Carol, my wife, will be there with a whole Human Garage team. And then the Sunday after that, which is the 22nd or 21st one of those go to humangarage.net there actually i think they're saturdays 14th and 21st i'm the next weekends after that are in miami which are sundays but uh 14th and 21st are both that that makes more sense so the 21st is a big huge event in orange county 
we'll all be there. And you guys, it's really cool to be in the presence of hundreds, you know, like over a thousand people all doing the same thing, all aligning themselves, all saying things like, I forgive my mother, I forgive my father, I forgive myself. We just went a little bit deeper into how that can work. What does it mean to forgive? And if you're just joining this live now, I will repost it. There is a big chunk of what I mean by that. How do we reorient ourselves with the past? There are some prerequisites, right? We must have the gnosis that the past can be reoriented or that we could actually reorient ourselves to the past. If we don't have that gnosis, then we're not going to be able to do that. Take care, everybody. If you want to know more, raw underscore of underscore earth is uh, where I'm at. Peace outside.